I wrote the first piece about women chefs in New West Magazine in, I think, 1979 or 80. Their stories were amazing because what they had put up with was stunning. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm Editor-in-Chief Matt Rodbard, here with Senior Editor Anna Hiesel. Today on the show, we have prolific editor, restaurant reviewer, and memoirist Ruth Reichel. We also later on will have Deb Perlman answering a reader question. But first, Matt, what was your conversation like with Ruth? Ruth Reichel on the Taste Podcast, what an honor. Uh, We talked about writing, of course, and the anthology she just edited, The Best American Food Writing. Taste might be in there. She also talks about the changing economics of the restaurant industry and why chefs are moving away from New York City in record numbers. Anna, can you guess where they're moving? Uh, to Portland, Oregon. Wrong. But actually, some are moving to Portland, but they're moving to other places, too. And I think there's one city in particular that she really liked to, to talk about. Which one? Well, we'll have to see on the podcast. Here's Matt talking to Ruth. Ruth Reichel, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. It's such an honor to have you here. It is my very great pleasure. Uh, So in 1971, your friend Pat said to you, uh, Ruth, you're such a good cook. Why don't you write a cookbook? Which you did. The book is called Mm, A Feastery. That's seven M's, I believe. And my question is... Only five M's. Oh, there's only five. Okay. (laughs) The the one I saw was seven. But you you know the number, of course. I want to know, in 2018, somebody comes to you and says... I want to write a cookbook, would you have the same response as your friend? No. I mean, it is such a different time. I mean, the idea that a 21-year-old can walk into a publishing house and say, hey, I have this great idea, I'm going to write a cookbook, and that they would say yes and give you an advance and never ask, can you cook? Where do the recipes come from? Who's tested the recipes? None of that. I mean, in 1971, they sort of said – Oh, a cookbook by a young person. That's an interesting idea. And this was a major publisher. Today, it's a completely different landscape. I mean, the whole food landscape yeah. is totally different than it was in 1970. I mean, 1971, people thought I was weird because I liked food. <laughs> but what? So that book you wrote in 1971, um, can you just describe it? I, I tried to buy it, and I believe on Abe, it's like $78 to buy if, a copy. If you found one for $78, buy it. Because the last <laughs> copy I bought was 350 oh, okay. And if you can find a hardcover copy, they go for thousands. Yeah. It was very small printing, yeah. and they only – they printed – um, 9,000 paperbacks and 1,000 hardbacks. And I think it was the first book, actually, that was published simultaneously, hardback and softback. Oh, wow. But it is very much a document of its time. Uh, I was living on the Lower East Side in a loft. The Lower East Side was very scary at that time. And we invited all our friends to come and do art for it. So there's art on every page. Who are uh, some of your friends? Um, well, Pat Alesco, who's a performance artist, was she opens every chapter in a costume. And um, so it was like, you know, my then husband is a sculptor and he did a bunch of stuff. And we had both been working for my father, who was a book designer. So we designed it ourselves. And it is really a very kind of 60s, 70s yeah. book. Um, the thing that makes me proud is one, I really could cook. And I did a lot of, put a lot of things in the book which were very unusual for that time. I made homemade pasta, uh, yeah. tripe, pig's ears, um, some Chinese food. Before Dean and DeLuca. Well, f- way before. Way Dean, before. Way Dean. before Dean and DeLuca. Yeah. Uh, but I was, the Lower East Side at that point was an amazing food place. You know, the old Jews were still down on, you know, Rivington Street and um, Chinatown was there and Little Italy was still a really vibrant community. And, you know, I would walk into De Paolo's and, um, you know, these little old ladies in black would say, you know, what are you going to do with that? And then they'd give me their recipe for Sunday sauce. So this was your pitch to the publisher, and they were like, yes, 22-year-old Ruth, we want you to write this document of this kind of food culture in the early 70s. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mocked up a chapter with mm. all the art, 
and I did an outline and I said, you know, I'm going to put anything I want in it. So there'll be a chapter on lemons and there'll be a chapter on holidays. And um, they were – they went with it. I draw a parallel because I, I – we're fast forwarding in 2018 and you're reading a lot of the zeitgeist, what's being published today. And I think there are – Lots of ways voices are getting out there into the into the world and being able to express this this creativity that you were able to express in seventy one. There's people are taking chances. Uh, do you agree with this? I do agree. That here's the difference, though, and this is a difference that you know cuts across all kinds of media. Um, today, if you want to do that, you can do it. You can do a blog. You can do it yourself. They actually gave me an advance. They gave me enough to live on for a year to re- to quit my horrible job and do this. And, I mean, that's the real difference. I mean, you used to be able to make a living as a writer or as a creative person. And these days, it's very, very difficult. So you in, in editing the, the Best American Food Writing of 2018 compilation, what themes are you seeing in food writing right now? And what are you most excited about? Okay, this is what I'm most excited about. When, when I took over Gourmet Magazine in 1999 and I said to the people who hired me, to Condé Nast, to my publishers, food is much more than recipes. And I'm, I want to publish more than just you know, recipes and restaurant suggestions and you know, how to spend your money on traveling. I mean, I think people need advice on – you know, on science, on government, um, you know, food is sociological. Um, mm-hmm. It's about race and gender. And they all looked at me like, are you crazy? And today, food writing has changed dramatically. And nobody would say, you know, oh, those aren't proper food subjects. So what this book is full of is really loud, passionate voices about all of these issues, about race, about gender. About They're looking at food as a business. They're looking at it scientifically. It is very different than a book like this would have been even five years ago. I want to read from your introduction. I love rich, deli- delicious prose. I could sit for hours reading Tejal Rao uh, tell about growing up with cookbooks. Few people describe food as poetically as Ligaya Michan, and reading Wyatt Williams is always a pleasure. These are some of the writers that you that you're drawn to. They are. I mean, I do. I love that kind of rich, poetic, descriptive writing, and I obviously wanted to put some of that in there. But truth be told, I mean, that's kind of the tradition of where food writing comes from. You know, to make you hungry, to describe meals in you know delicious, dripping detail. Um, that's not all I wanted to put in this book. And it absolutely is not all that is in this book. So talk about some of those other topics. Okay. So there, I mean, we are in a Me Too moment. And there is a lot about, you know, the ugly stuff that's been going on in restaurants. And one of my favorite pieces in this book is this screed that Amanda Cohen Mm -hmm. wrote um, about, you know, why are you all interested in me now Just because there's a Me Too moment, Um, I've been a working chef for many, many years and nobody's ever been interested in talking to me. And suddenly, um, wow, I'm a hot topic. And then she says, look, off the top of my head, I'm going to name 65 women chefs in New York City who have never gotten press until this moment. And I have to say, I read it and felt ashamed. Off the dome, I love Amanda Cohen, 65, just into her word pad on her phone. I must say, I, as editor of Metro Mix, a long forgotten publication, I, get, I named her chef of the year in 2009. So I just got to shut myself out. Yes. Well, good <laughs> good for you. Uh, but Amanda is a brilliant chef I, and, I, and also a writer who, who doesn't um, pull any punches. And she's also – she's an excellent writer. I mean this Amazing piece writer. just – I mean it is a cry for justice. It is angry. And that's part of what I love about the writing in this book is so much of it is really angry. Helen Rosner's piece – Helen Rosner's piece. Again, we're in the mo- the Me Too mo- moment, and she's you know she goes into Mario Batali much deeper than oh, you know he groped some women. I mean she she really goes into 
um, where this comes from and what it means. Let's talk about Kushbu Shah's piece. Um, she went and visited the Pioneer Woman. It was a brilliant piece. I, I love Kushbu's writing. She writes for taste. What drew you to that work? First of all, she's a wonderful writer. Secondly, it is um, it's a terrific piece of investigative <laughs> reporting, um, which again is something that we need more of in the food space. You know, I mean, she goes in with a preset notion of what she's going to find. And then she finds something completely different, kind of shocking. So it starts out, you think this is going to be, oh, this like nice piece about the pioneer woman and middle America. Puff and piece. then <laughs> bang, it just opens up. And um, you know, she she gives it time. She, I mean, she spent a lot of energy on this piece, and um, it made me really proud. You know, oh wait, this is what food writing can do. It really is. When you, you mentioned um, more investigation, just I'm sure you have. You're an editor at heart. You have a list somewhere where about pieces that you want to write or investigate or assign. What needs to be investigated right now in oh, food? Oh my God! I mean the. I think that the biggest thing we need to, I mean, and people, I mean, Marion Nessel just wrote a book about it, but everybody needs to be shouting about how much big food is influencing what we eat in a really bad way and how they influence science. I mean, we did some pieces on this in Gourmet, um, but... It can't be said often enough or loudly enough, and I feel like we ought to be reading th things about this every day because it affects every one of us every day. It's a really important thing that scientists are being influenced. They're in the pocket. They're in the pocket. And, you know, we have, we have a real crisis in this country, a food crisis, and it needs to be addressed over and over and over again so nobody can look away from it. How do we do that in a world of shrinking budgets, shrinking advertising, food media is more competitive and there's less ad dollars going around? Um, are we going um, – are we crowdfunding journalism? Are we – are we going in, in different directions with doing it via podcast instead of it being a traditional print story? How do we get this story out there? Well, I have to tell you that my own feeling about this is how you really influence people is you do the investigation and then you make a great story out of it. And I think, it, I think we need movies. We need TV shows. I mean, I think that done not as, oh, I'm going to hit you over the head with this um, with this dry information. I think we need another Grapes of Wrath. We need a, a really great writer to – or many really great writers and screenwriters and TV writers to address this so that we pull it into ourselves. So we're looking at it from that – fiction place and in, instead of the, you know, documentary place. I agree. And I think podcast for me is an interesting format. There's so much empathy in a podcast. And I think these topics need empathy. And those long, dry investigative pieces oftentimes don't have the empathy. Well, it's, it's also they're very hard to do. There are very few uh, writers who, I mean, I can think of like three really on yeah. who can really make those kind of investigative pieces compelling. Michael Pollan can mm -hmm. do it. Ted Genoways does it, and Barry Estabrook does it. Mm -hmm. But there are very—I mean—that is, it is extremely hard yeah. to boil that kind of information down to something that you want—that's a compelling read that makes you want to keep turning the pages. I want to talk about your own writing. Um, you know, memoirs are are candid and. They're on the verge of gossipy, and I think you really have taken the memoir to a to a to a great level. It's a really hot copy. And my question is, um, has anything you've ever written come back to haunt you? Um, no. Um, there were a couple of pieces I wrote when I was a restaurant critic that haunted me, but I have. I mean, I, I don't try and settle scores. Um, if I'm doing sensitive things, I usually show it to the person before 
I print it. Like, for instance, in Tender at the Bone, I was talking about Marion Cunningham's long battle with alcoholism and agoraphobia. And I actually sent her the chapters and said, you know, I, this isn't my story to tell. It's your story. So if you have a problem with any of this, tell me now before it's printed. Um, and, you know, I chronicle an affair in Comfort Me with Apples. And I actually called Coleman and said, um, do you want to read it? Do you want me to change your name? You know, before this goes out there, let's talk about it. I do not think that, you know, other people's secrets are yours to tell. It's a great statement. And we're talking about Coleman Andrews, who was the editor of Savour at the time. And you're the editor of Gourmet at the time. And this book comes out. Take us back to that moment. It's amazing. Uh, well, OK. So, you know, Coleman and I have worked together on and off for virtually our entire careers. Um, you know, he was my editor. Uh, then I was his editor. I mean, we've bounced back and forth. Um so early in my career, he was my editor at New West Magazine, um, and we had this affair that um, – In France. In France um, that was pretty wonderful and ended pretty shockingly. And when I became the editor of Gourmet, he took me out for lunch. and He was then the editor of Sever and said – um, this is going to be really interesting because it's going to be interesting to see if you can make a better magazine with too much money like you're going to have or too little money like I have. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out in an interesting way for both of you. Let's talk about New York City. Um, are you nostalgic about the good old days of New York City restaurants? Because we, when we talk about good old days, we could talk about many eras. I'm thinking of the 1970s personally into the early 80s where French restaurants really ruled – well, you, you know, I wasn't in New York in the 70s right. and 80s. Yeah. I, I went to California in 1973. Okay. So I have no nostalgia for that era of New York. What I do have nostalgia for, I mean, I think New York is the best food city it's ever been right now, although I think that's going to change. I mean, the money, the money thing here, I mean, I just read about another restaurant closing because the lease was – untenable. And when you have someone like Anita Lowe, who had a wonderful restaurant that had three stars that everybody loved, that was packed every night, and then she closed it because she couldn't make a living, that says something really bad about what's happening in New York. But what really bothers me, I mean, I grew up in New York. I love this city. I hate that you have to be rich or old to live in this city pretty much. I mean, it, it is, um, you know, I mean, when my husband and I moved back here after college in 1970, yeah, we lived in a gritty neighborhood and it was a little scary, but we could live there. And all our artist friends, you know, were living in lofts before there was Soho and, um, you know, uh, Patti Smith and Maple. I mean, all there was a real creative life here. Artists could afford to live here. Um, and now, unless, you know, you're like me and you bought your apartment, you know, 40 years ago, um, you can't afford to live here. And um, that's really wrong. And it's, you know, that there are all these rich people who buy apartments and don't live in them. And um, it, it, the the whole quality of life in the city is changing. You know, I mean, I grew up in Greenwich Village and nobody I knew. One, I did not know a single person who owned their own apartment growing up. You know, it was a rental economy and um, creative. You know, my parents never had much money, but, you know, the public schools were good and our life was very pleasant. And, you know, I mean, we knew interesting people um, and – it was a great place. You know, my parents went to the Philharmonic. They went on the bus. I mean, they never took a taxi in their lives. But, you know, they went every week to the Philharmonic and they could afford to do that. And now it's become a kind of Disneyland of a city. Can the restaurant industry become higher margin? Because the margins are what we're talking about. It's a low margin industry. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, when I leave here, I'm about to go to the Four Seasons, the, the brand new Four Seasons. And what did they spend $30 million opening that restaurant? And will they ever get that money back? I mean, does it matter? 
I, I don't know. I don't know. And that's the problem. There's so much uh, investment in the city with very little consequence that, you know, these real these 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 vacancies remain and these 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 leases are signed with no consequences. I mean, I just I keep thinking back to I was in Charleston for a food festival a year and a half ago. And I was walking around with Andrew Carmelini, and he said, every restaurant I've been to, there's some kid who worked for me because none of them can afford to open in New York. And they're, and that's what's happening. I mean, people are leaving the city and opening in other cities. And you're, earlier on, you hinted at the, a, sh- a subtle shift away from New York. And I'm just going to take a wild guess about a city that I think um, is really where everyone's moving to, and it's shifting, and it's Los Angeles. That's That's right. I mean, Los Angeles is... Um, it's still affordable for the creative class um, because of the demographics of the city. I mean, you can you can spread out, you go further east, but um, you know the the food there is absolutely fantastic. Um, and interestingly, it has never been a city that has a lot of really high end restaurants. It, what that city has always done really well are small. Interest. I mean, what used to be called ethnic restaurants, I don't know what we call them today. International, food from other places, it's a word that we always try to figure out. Ethnic, it says what it is. Right. Um, and, you know, it has always been the best city in the country and one of the best cities in the world for the food of many different places, which makes no concessions to, you know, a middle class population. I mean, if you know, if you want to serve Thai food only to Thai people, you can do that. Yeah, in North Hollywood, it's the most amazing place to get Thai or San Gabriel Valley. Yeah, you know, I mean, they, there are whole swaths of the San Gabriel Valley where you never see anything except in Mandarin. And Koreatown. And we'll Koreatown, about- you know, hundreds and hundreds of restaurants yeah. in Koreatown. I, I find it interesting, though, that the, the, the one Jonathan Gold piece you picked here was her Vespertine Review. Which is a high-end thousand-dollar restaurant. Was that a comment on the city? What? Why did you pick that piece? Um, I picked it for a number of reasons. First of all, when I was sent a bunch of articles, there was not a Jonathan piece in there, but there were five pieces that began. I want to be the next Jonathan Gold, and so I called Jonathan and said, "Look." Um, this is ridiculous. I mean, everybody wants to be Jonathan Gold. We have to have a piece of yours in here. What pieces would you put of your own in here? And that was one of the pieces that he suggested. But the reason that I put it in, and um, it's really been underscored by his recent and very shocking death, is nobody talks about what a great restaurant critic he was for high-end restaurants as well. I mean, everybody talks about how, you know, he made Los Angeles discover itself and he sent everybody out to eat tacos and um, at a He had range. And, but he, he was also an extraordinary – I mean, he – as, as Lori Ochoa, his wife and one of my closest friends, um, said – you know, Jonathan was one of those people who knew how to make chefs be the best that they could. And I felt it was really important to say, hey, wait a minute, pay attention to this guy's writing when he's not telling you to go to Senor Fish or, you know, um, some Korean hot pot place. I mean, pay attention to how thoughtful he is about the whole zeitgeist of restaurants. What's happening at the LA Times right now and the food desk? It feels like it's going it's to have a moment with this new investment in the LA Times and hiring two critics. Um, it's the most exciting food city in America. Well, I mean, I think it's everybody in LA, I think, is kind of shocked that the New York Times was smart enough to send Tedgel there. You know, I mean, um, it's a response. I mean, we can theorize about why they did that. I mean, I would have done it as an edit. I mean, I would have seen that opportunity and swooped right in there, which Sam did. Yes. And it was brilliant. I mean, it was really brilliant. I mean, I I have enormous – there are two pieces of Mm Tedgels in this piece because she's, I think, both a beautiful writer, um, very knowledgeable about food, um, a lovely person, and sort of everything you want. You don't want another cisgendered white male to be – 
the critic. And, you know, I mean, so Tejal sort of is perfect in every way. And I, if I were the LA Times, I would be very, very worried. And, you know, I mean, and there's a real opportunity because I, I assume she's going to be covering all of California. And Michael Bauer just <laughs> retired from the Chronicle. So you've got this sort of void in restaurant criticism in California and a real opportunity. I think every able food writer is sending their resume to both of those publications right now. Right. Um, I'm pretty sure that what the LA Times is going to do is try and get a lot of voices. You know, I mean, I was the food editor of the LA Times at its its heyday. I mean, when I was the food editor of the LA Times, it was 60 pages every week. It was two sections. We had our own test kitchen. We had our own photo studio. And it was the cash cow for the paper. It brought in $35 million a year in ads. Um, so it was extraordinary. It was an extraordinary. It was ahead of its time it, it, yeah, it, in many ways. It was, it was. I mean, I'm very proud of you that should be. food section. You should be. Lori and Jonathan and I pretty much did it together. Yeah. And we hired great people. I mean, Charlie Perry, who's like a wonderful food historian. Um, we hired, you know, Russ. Um, we had um, Tony Tipton was there. I mean, we, we had really great people there and a big staff. And we really said, we're going to cover this city. We're, we're going to really... I mean, uh, among other things, um, at one point we had Tony go and spend time with a woman who was living on food stamps. Yeah. And, um, you know, I said, don't go to the welfare office and ask them. I said, go to this supermarket, Somebody. look uh, look for people who are paying with food stamps and find someone. So she found this woman who had four kids, no refrigerator, and, you know, did this piece about what it was like to really live on food stamps. Were you paying better then than – than we would expect? Or were you were you paying fair rates? Like, what were the rates like that you were paying writers? Well, first of all, I mean, I think I had 20 full-time writers. I mean, we had a lot you of full-time. staff writers. We had staff writers. And the LA Times was still owned by the Chandler family, who were extremely generous. I mean, their, their MO was, we are going to pay better than market rates because we don't want to be unionized. It was It was an amazing place to work, actually. I mean, there were people who spent, not in my section, but in other sections, there were pe- people who famously spent a whole year working on one story. I, I read a, a remembrance of the sports desk, and the, I think the editor had was it, had the ability of picking a new piece of art every year for your office. Was this the case for you? No, it was not. In fact, my office was a converted <laughs> broom closet. Okay. So you didn't have the great office. <laughs> um, but it was it was kind of an amazing place to yeah. work, and if you had energy, they'd let you pretty much do whatever you wanted. And we had a lot of fun doing that. And and you know, for instance, Jonathan didn't want to be on staff because he wanted to own his own pieces. So we paid him well for you know we paid him well to write those pieces, and then he owned them. Did he do anything with them? Well, there's a book of, yeah. of his writing from oh. that time. Oh, okay. Let's swing back to the New York Times. And I want to know, like, how are they doing? I know we just spoke about Sam, and I think Sam has done an amazing job with the section. But how are the critics doing? What's your report uh, card of the current critics? Well, I, I like them very much. I mean, the thing that hurts me is I think Lagaya Mashan is is – about the best person writing on food today, and she gets overlooked all the time. I mean, people don't even. I, I say, you know, you should read her stuff. She, I mean, the word, her language is gorgeous. I mean, she has an MFA in poetry. I've never met her, so oh, you never not, met her. She's never pretty, met her. Yeah. I've never met her, but I, I'm an enormous fan of hers. And it bothers me that Pete, people only. I love Pete too. I mean, I. I um, I'm very jealous of what he's been able to do. I mean, they never would have let me do that that um, that fantastic piece he did about uh, Guy Fieri's oh, yeah. plays. Yeah. But it was like it was the most perfect piece because one, I mean, writing mean pieces it, it doesn't feel good if you're a decent person. I mean, it feels really bad. Mm-hmm. But this is a this is a mean person that a mean piece that couldn't hurt anyone, right? Because the people who went to that restaurant aren't going to read or care what the New York Times thinks, right? So he got to do this savagely funny, nasty review without 
I mean, it was a total gimme, and it was a brilliant piece of writing. And, and it allowed him a little flexibility, and I think a good editor allows the writers to have a win once in a while, and his editor let him have that win. Yeah, but I mean, I, 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 think, I think he's really good. I mean, the one thing that I don't like that he did, I mean, I think the piece he did about local in L.A. was, if I had been his editor, I would have tried to talk him out of it. It felt... There was some other things happening behind the scenes. I'll leave it at that. I felt like there was maybe some, I don't know. I have no idea. I just felt like, I mean, that we need more restaurants like local. Um, if your listeners don't know what it is, it's a restaurant in Watts that um, was done by Daniel Patterson and Roy Choi. And they trained local people to work there. These are people who'd never had jobs before. And... Um, it was using a fast food format to do something really community minded. And I think that they should be commended for that. And they shouldn't be reviewing the bad coffee. And, and it, it yeah. doesn't matter. It doesn't what matter the what the coffee is like. is like. Yeah, I agree um, with you. And the community loves it and it's been important. And I just want more. I want them to open them in, you know, every dicey neighborhood in America. Who are some other young writers that you're that you're really drawn to? Maybe we'll say under the age of thirty. Well, Mayuk Sen, am I pronouncing? Yes, yeah, Mayuk's great. Yep. I mean, I think he's really wonderful. Um, you know, I don't know how old most people yeah, are. Yeah, hard. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are a couple of young writers at the New Yorker who are good. Hannah Goldfeld, mm-hmm. um, restaurant but, critic there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, but I really, you know, I just I read people mm-hmm. and I tend to think they're all young, and then it turns out, <laughs> oh, you know, oh, they're forty five. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to tell. I think a lot of the folks in in the food world have. I think people have come to food writing from outside of food writing, and you write about this in your introduction as well. I think we're seeing this; we're really flush with talent right now. Yeah, and, and people who are wonderful, right? I mean, I I discovered people. I mean, I, I, first of all, I discovered some publications that I didn't know about, which I'm ashamed. Like Bitter Southerner, which is absolutely fantastic, and is doing some really wonderful stuff in the food space. And these are clearly not people who are food writers. But, um, you know, I used to say at Gourmet, every writer has at least one good food piece in them. Now I think every writer has at least 10 good food pieces in them. I agree. I want to talk about Me Too a little bit. Um, I think, let me, how do I phrase this? I feel complicit. I feel like we've missed a lot of things. I've been doing this for 15 years. You've been doing it for longer. Um, I think looking at John Besh, April Bloomfield, Mario Batali, and their and their stories. How do we come to terms with this as writers who've written about these three chefs? I've written about all of them. You've likely written about all of them. Let me let me back this up a little and say, um, I'm a little shocked that the restaurant industry is getting such focus for this because I mean I have to say that as a young freelance writer, I had experienced much more of this as a writer than I ever did working in restaurants. Um, I, yes, it happens in the industry and a lot of it happens in the industry because for such a long time, we've followed the French model, which pretty much depends on, you know, like, you know, Robuchon was like famously not, he didn't famously um, grope women. No. But, he was a psychopath. But I'll say it. <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean, people thought that this was the way restaurants had to run and it was accepted. So I don't think it was just women who suffered. I mean, I think everybody suffered in that atmosphere. And um, people are beginning to walk back that whole notion. But we're going to hear a lot more about you know, horrible people in the industry uh, before it ends. What I will say is that as a young woman entering the work world, I considered it transactional, right? When a guy who was your boss came on to you, it was your job to put him off, rebuff him without hurting his feelings, And I just thought that was the way of the world. And it has been the way of the world for most of human history, right? I mean, women have been the targets of guys who, you know, made them feel powerful to, you know, 
be sexual with you. Um, we need to change that across the board, not just in restaurants. Um, I don't think it's your job as a restaurant critic to go in and say, you know, ha has has this guy ever abused you? I mean, it's just that's not your job. For criticism. For criticism. What about as an editor for a, you know, a publication that covers the world of food, the culture of food? Is it uh, our responsibility? Certainly now that we know what's going on behind the kitchen door, we sh you know, if we before, I mean, I put Mario on the cover. I loved Mario. I mean, I I never I knew him for years. I never saw any of this kind of behavior. Um certainly if I were going to put him on the cover today, I would investigate. You know, I would go around and sort of like, you know, say to my reporters, go talk up the people in the kitchen, go, you know, find out from the wait staff what it's like to work there. You know, I mean, it it is our responsibility as editors to make sure that we are not glorifying pigs. I agree. And well said. And I think just back going back to our conversation about um, we're flush with talent. There's a lot happening in this world that's non-white, male, et cetera. I think we have this wonderful opportunity to not write about John Besh, not write about April Bloomfield, not write about Mario Batali, not write about celebrity chefs, and write about the unknown chefs and the unknown cooks. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's I think that's why I felt so bad when I read Amanda's piece because. I mean, I have to say, you know, Gourmet closed in 2009. It was hard. We tried hard to find chefs of color. You know, I mean, it's like why everybody wrote so much about Patrick Clark. Great guy. Um, wonderful chef. And, oh, my God, thank God he's, you know, there's someone of color. But it was really hard to find people of color. And it was hard to find women chefs. I mean, it was easy to find women pastry chefs. But, you know, if you we would we tried, we would say, you know, let let's get more women in here. And you would try and, and you know, there were the usual suspects. Um, and it's interesting to me, I, I wrote the first piece about women chefs in New West Magazine in I think 1979 or 80. I, I, I wrote about five women. Alice Waters, Judy Rogers, um, Mary Sue Milliken, and Susan Feniger, Evan Kleiman, who was who then had a rest. Oh, six women and a woman named w Wendy Little, um, and their stories were amazing because what they had tr put up with was stunning. Um, this was about abuse. About well, this was about their path. Their path. You know, I mean, uh, Mary Sue Milliken, beautiful woman. Still a beautiful woman. <laughs> um, graduated from from chef school. She was living in Chicago. She wanted to work at Le Perroquet, which was the best restaurant. She went every day for a year and said, "I want a job in the kitchen." And Jovan Trebojevic, the owner, said, "I'll give you a job as a hat check girl." And then one day, he was short in the kitchen, and he said, "Okay." You can go into the kitchen. They tortured her back there. She ended up running the kitchen. Uh, but all these women, I mean, somebody else, I can't remember who it was, had a story of being hi hired and the French chef went up to the skylight and started pouring buckets of water down on her. I mean, they got hazed and tortured and they just toughed it out. Um, and we all thought the day of the woman chef is coming. And then somehow it never came. Only now it's come, but 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 this is like this is a long time later. Uh, I mean, we're talking about almost three decades later. Yeah, yeah, more than three decades, almost four decades later. I'm going to review that piece. I I love to to read that and and process it now. Um, let's talk about gourmet. There's a memoir being released in the spring. It yes. is your gourmet memoir. It is my gourmet. Memoir. We will not talk about it. We will have you back here on the Taste Podcast in the spring. But tell us, give us a teaser. Um, well, it's called. Um, Save Me the Plums. And it sort of starts with me being offered this job and saying, I'm not the one. I mean, are you crazy? I don't know how to run a magazine. So a lot of it is about 
you know, one trying to change the the whole idea of what an Epicurean magazine could be. And um, two, it's about me coming to terms with being a boss, which um, was not easy for me. Ruth Reichel, it's been a pleasure having you on the Taste Podcast. Well, this has been really fun. That time just flew by. <laughs> Here's Deb Perlman answering a reader question. So we're hanging out in Deb Perlman's kitchen right now. Deb Perlman of Smitten Kitchen. And we have a question for you from a reader. What's an unpopular food that you think is due for a comeback? I want, you know, those good seasons or good seasoning? Good seasons. Those salad dressing packets, and then you get the glass carafe, and it shows you exactly where the oil goes and exactly where the vinegar goes, and you shake it up. I want those to come back. I think that they were, I think about them a lot as an adult. Like that was like our go to salad dressing, and it was very simple. And you could use your good olive oil and your like imported vinegar. Not that we did, because I grew up in central Jersey, but you could, you could. And and it just had just the right seasoning, and it was the perfect little dressing. (laughs) What would that look like in 2018? What do you think the flavor combos would be? or the flavoring packets. I know we could totally, I know this totally needs to happen. You would totally have to have one that's like a fish sauce, lime, ginger kind of thing. You would have to do like a sriracha mayo one and you would have to do, but I think the old school one, it was really just like garlic, oregano, parsley, pepper flakes, and it had like a nice kick to it. I mean, it's a pretty solid dressing for a lot of heartier salads. Kind of like an Olive Garden Italian dressing sort of vibe, right? I'm going to have to go there and find out. <laughs> oh, God, am I just admitting that I haven't been to an Olive Garden before? It's my loss. I see it as my loss. The salads there are really good. Iceberg lettuce, Italian dressing. Iceberg lettuce is another thing that's like high list. I've been trying to bring back wedge salads for a bunch of years. I think I've been fairly successful in it. I like, like I'll credit myself. But um, when I first started my son, I'm like, why does nobody make wedge salads anymore? I love a good blue cheese wedge, a good crunchy, cold, crisp salad with bacon and a rich dressing. I don't know. There's nothing not to like. Do you have any wedge salad recipes in either of your cookbooks? I actually have one in my first cookbook. And what I do is I actually, and I got this idea from a restaurant that's, of course, since closed because this is New York. Um, but what they would do is instead of doing wedges, which, of course, are not really going to work to keep things on, they would do like one inch segments, like slices across. And it's actually nice because you can really infuse the stuff better. And I think I used, um, actually used fried shallots and, instead of bacon. And I'm not saying, I mean, I love bacon, but it's actually, I think fried shallots are so good there that you don't miss it at all. And I think I did some radishes and celery. Oh, that's another really unpopular ingredient that I want to give its due. People hate celery and I love it. Uh, <laughs> you're like, you're just getting upset just hearing that. It's, it's refreshing uh, though. It's a hard sell, but it's a refreshing, here for, iconic ingredient. <laughs> um, yeah, so I did, I, and with a classic blue cheese dressing and then in my second cookbook I did I call it a cauliflower wedge but it was mostly just about doing big wedges of cauliflower with all of the complimentary stuff I like on it thanks Deb you gotta go to an olive garden now endless breadsticks right yeah absolutely I'm here for that the taste podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me Anna Hiesel the show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis studio recordings by Pat Stango Theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>